Go for it. Let's do it. Let's do this. Um, thanks everybody for turning up. Hope you all managed to get some lunch. A few are probably still stuck in the queue. Uh, appreciate you coming to see this when you could have gone and saw seen some probably scary stuff with some generalised adversarial networks in the, in the room downstairs. Maybe that's full and so I just got the rejects that didn't get there in time. I don't know. I was thinking to myself over lunch, if I get two or three people, I'm, we're all going to see the gangs. But I've got some more than that, so uh, we'll do this instead. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, writing policies as code. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a scene set for you, and then I'm going to quick introduction to uh, I think called Open Policy Agent. I branded myself for the occasion, as you can see. Um, and some examples of, of OPA in action, and then um, some other examples of how that same uh, sort of framework can be leveraged in a, in a sort of shift left mechanism uh, to, to help us. A um, little bit about me, if, if any of you have been to these events before, you may have seen me before, this is my third year speaking. Um, I, I'm a software architect mainly, uh, but also sort of a technologist. And, and when I'm allowed to write code, which is not very often, I'm a gopher. Um, I currently work for a small company in Bristol called Adaga, uh, where I do everything to do with the infrastructure, um, or at least I sort of spouse architecturally about everything to do with the infrastructure and other people make it happen. Um, but more importantly, I'm a very much a self-confessed giant shoulder standerer. That's a word. Um, and so, in particular, the stuff I'm going to talk about today, I, I was put onto this uh, by a guy I kind of half know, because I follow him on Twitter, called Gareth Rusgrove. Um, I went to a talk that he did uh, at KubeCon this year about this subject, and it piqued my interest. So really, all I'm hoping to do today is pique your interest. I'm not, it's not a deep dive, it's a teaser about capabilities that exist in this space, um, and hopefully, like I did when, uh, when Gareth presented it at, uh, at KubeCon, you'll go away thinking, actually, yeah, I could really use that. Um, as I'm a technologist, I have to apologize to begin with uh, for the quality of the slides. I, I decided to use a different uh, presentation software because, you know, why, why always use the same one? So I thought I'd try a new one, a different one. I'm not going to tell you what it is because I absolutely hate it. <laughs> but I was too far through the process to switch. Um, you'll see in, in, in a minute why I hate it. Some of the code examples just don't work, but never mind, we'll, we'll battle through. Generally, it does do what it should do, which is present slides, so we'll go. So I guess the, the premise here is that, that um, you know, in, a, in a DevOps type environment, uh, as I am, uh, spend my, my working life, you, you, you work really hard, uh, you, you kind of have this mantra, everything has code, uh, and you tend to work really hard on infrastructure as code because that's you know the the, the part the, where the tooling exists. Um, so you know we all know the the sort of mantras and, and the cloud enabled stuff that's come along. No more snowflakes. No more point and click to configure stuff. Yeah, we, we, um, I, I hopefully many in the room like me um, work in a company where all our infrastructure is built using Terraform. Um, and then that gives us Kubernetes clusters and then all of our application deployment is done using Kubernetes manifests. Um, so from start to finish, we're using infrastructure as code and declarative um, manifests to, to deploy. And it's great. It's exactly how it should be and life is good. But then somewhere, somewhere in the intranet of your company, there's some policies that's written down. And, and you know, for example, um, in, in this one, there's a whole load of Word documents in a folder called security ISO 27001. <coughs> there's lots and lots of information in those about don't do this, you must do that, you must follow these processes and procedures. And it's all written in Word, um, and it's great. And our CISO rests happy at night saying, you know, I've, I've defined the boundaries within which I am comfortable and, uh, and the developers are working. Um, and then he comes to me in the morning and says, why were they allowed to do that? They shouldn't be allowed to do that. Paragraph three, subsection two of our security policy says, do not do that. So why did they do it? The answer is they didn't know, they didn't read it, they'd forgotten, it was easy. 
et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the other place where policies live is, um, you know, in, in, so that's the sort of management side of things. And, and here, you know, we use Confluence. Um, and we've got 1,375 pages in our Confluence environment. Embedded in that is going to be a lot of good practice, a lot of guidelines. You, know, you should really configure things like this. It's the way we want to do it. And the, you know, please follow these standards. But again, it's text. It's not actionable. People have to go and look. You know, do, is, is there a standard port number that I should um, stand my service up on? Uh, no, well, I don't know, so I'm just going to put it on 5,000. Oh, everyone else has got a different port number. Never mind, that's fine. Um, but somewhere in there, it will say, always use port. 3026, because we're weird. Um, but you know, that's written in a document and, and not everywhere follows it. So how can we take some of this stuff out and put it into code? And where are the guardrails? Where are the guardrails in place? Because essentially policies that, that we want people to follow fall into sort of two different camps. Don't do stupid things, which is my generic term for security policies, and follow our in-house convention, which is my generic thing things for. I've decided that port 3023 is a really good one and everybody must use it because I'm a kingmaker. Uh, where are those guardrails in, in, our, in our everyday life? Along comes a tool called Open Policy Agent. Now Open Policy Agent is a policy enforcement engine for configuration. Um, it's part of Cloud Native Compute Foundation's stack um, and it's a really interesting tool. So the idea behind OPA, I think that might be how you say it, um, is that if you're writing a service and you want that service to have policies, then you've got to go and write an awful lot of code to deal with policies. You've got to, you want the user to be able to define some, some policies, and then your service refers to them at runtime to decide whether or not to do things. Um, you've got to make up a language, you know, or maybe you're going to use the mouse. You've got to come up with a grammar. You've got to be able to parse that to make sure it's okay. Uh, you've got to worry about, well, how, do, how, do, you know, how does my service receive updates of that policy in real time uh, if I change it, if I want to deploy a change to the policy? And all that sort of stuff that is boilerplate code that, um, that you want to do. Uh, so along comes Open that says, we do all that for you. So we are a self-contained tool. You run us as a sidecar, if you like, and you talk to us. And every time you need to make a policy decision, you defer to us. And then we manage that whole policy ecosystem of allowing, allowing policy rules to be added in and all that sort of stuff. It's a really interesting piece of, uh, of tech. It's slowly being integrated into some of the cloud native uh, things. So um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to show a little bit about Kubernetes and how they've integrated it into that, um, because that's kind of my thing. Um, but you know, it's also been integrated into uh, other tools like Ceph, for example. So a lot of you, know, you can set up all your authorization in, in, of your object store if you use Ceph to be handled by, uh, by OPA. And the idea is that it, we can come up with a standard way of writing policies and a standard language and a, and a rich tool set around it so that everything benefits. It uses a language called Rego. Um, to, to define its policies. Now, I've got lots of words on here, so I'm not, I'm not going to read them through. But basically, OPA is a purpose-built tool um, for reasoning about our policies. And so Rego is a, is a purpose-built language. Um, if you're really old like me, then you may remember Datalog, um, which is a query language way before SQL. Um, and all they've done is they've taken Datalog because it's really a powerful query language that's very easy to sort of formally prove. And they've extended it to understand how to delve into structured documents like JSON and YAML and things like that. Uh, and so they've made this sort of um, language by blending those two things together, something old and something new, um, that allows you to declaratively define your uh, set of policies. OK, I'm going to show you an example. Um, it's in Kubernetes, as I said. So um, front and center, if you, if you go to the OPA website. The first example they have on their homepage is a Kubernetes one. Um, and, and they have a picture like this. So this, this is how OPA, the tool, is, is sort of embedded. So I don't know if you know much about Kubernetes, but in Kubernetes you have um, admission controllers. Now these are allowed to uh, intercept requests 
uh, a, a user or a machine says. So, you know, create me a new pod. They're allowed to intercept that and they're allowed to reject it if they don't like the looks of it. Um, and, and so Open Policy Agent is embedded into a web admission hook called Gatekeeper. And it means that we can write policies in Rego that, that, that Kubernetes will uh, think. So the first silly example I'm going to use, um, in theory taken straight from our policies, but as I haven't delved into those Word documents in a while, it might not be in there, but it should be. Um, developers are not allowed to create public facing services in the dev cube cluster. So this is an interesting one because it's a great example of where something like Gatekeeper and a, and a rich policy uh, engine helps because I can, um, I can prevent a developer from creating a service because that is something that I can control at the role level within Kubernetes. You're, you're a developer, you're not allowed to create objects of type service. But I can't allow them to create services and then restrict the type of service that they can create through roles. Uh, so I need another layer, and that's where this uh, the sort of policy engine comes in. So this is your first exposure to Rego. Um, it's right in the top left of the screen for some reason. Again, that's the well, my thing. I apologize for that. And also, the syntax highlighting is bizarre. Uh, I managed to choose a language where the 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 uh, the, Git, the presentation software I'm using says, yeah, we, we, we render code in 185 different languages and we highlight it and we colorize it. The language I'm using is not one of those 185, <laughs> it seems. Oh well, but here, here's, here's a little thing and I'll, I'll walk you through this. So, um, first, are we creating or updating a service? So, we're looking at the input, the request kind. Of, if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, I apologize. Um, but we got not, we're going to be given an object of, which is, has a kind service. And the operation we're doing is either create or update. So, so those, these are basically uh, statements. Both of those are true if I'm creating a service. Now, is the object type, the service type, a load balancer? If it is, then again, if you don't know Kubernetes, as soon as you say, create me a load balancing service, the machine springs into action and says, oh, public facing. Let me just do all the magic I need to do to, to make that hang. So yeah, we don't really want that. If, if it's a load balancing service, it's an owner. Unless they've added a particular annotation into their manifest, that, uh, and this is a Google Cloud example that says, use an internal load balancer, please. And if all of those things are true, or if, if, if those things aren't true, sorry, then we're going to deny that request. So you can create services, that's not a problem. Um, but you can't create services of type load balancer unless you specify it's an internal one. So now with that policy, my developers can create internal services that offer services on our internal network but outside communities, but they can't create public facing ones. So that's an example of um, a, a policy written in, in, in that language. Another example, ingress names must be whitelisted. Um, so again, it's very similar. This sits as a web admission hook. If you try and create an ingress, an ingress is something that associates a uh, host name with a service, then what it will do is say, okay, that sort of magic says, there's a host name buried in that request and does it FQDM match with a list of valid ingress hosts? And in this particular example, um, we're fetching a list of valid ingress hosts from Kubernetes itself. So, so what we're saying here is attached to the namespace that uh, we're working in is an, is an attribute, an annotation that says, these are valid uh, ingress hosts. This is the whitelist. And so we will double check that. So this means that me as a um, production engineer, not a developer, I can push a new ingress into Kubernetes to uh, Kubernetes, but it, it, it adds some policies to make sure that I'm doing it right. So those are, um, those are some, some examples of Rego. Um, it's a little bit of a brain meld when you first, um, when you first kind of look at it, because it's a bunch of assertions that all have to be true for the thing to pass, and, it, and it's, not, it's not like a programming language where you can have sort of for loops and, and things like that. You've just got to define the assertions. Okay. And that's uh, a context of 
uh, something running. So something where a running service, in this case Kubernetes, has integrated OPA uh, and allowed us to, to define some services. But what we want to do actually is we want to put policies um, much further on in the, uh, much earlier in the, in the process. So we want to shift left our, our sort of policy test. It's all very well that we now, you know, we, we know how to write policies that can protect against errant actions on our Kubernetes cluster. But really, by that point, you know, we shouldn't really be letting um, those actions get that far. Somewhere through our build system, we should say, actually, what you're trying to do, the thing you've instigated, isn't going to work at the back end. Uh, so stop now. So we're going to shift slightly, um, sort of left in, in our build process here. And to do that, we're going to use another tool called ConfTest. Now, ConfTest is the tool that Gareth Rushgrove, the guy who I sort of name checked at the beginning, authored um, originally, and, and he's still involved in it. And, and ConfTest is a sort of a version of OPA. It leverages OPA in terms of the sort of the way he does rules, but it's designed as a standalone tool that you can run against uh, configuration data in a structured form with a set of policies to say yes or no, that passes. So ConfTest is an ideal thing for us to put into our build pipeline. Um, so yeah, you write your policies using Rego and you apply them to configuration files. And it supports all sorts of configuration files. Um, so anything that's where the configuration is in YAML or JSON or an any file or uh, HCL, which is Terraform's language, um, or Q. Anybody use Q? Google it afterwards. Fantastic language. It's from Google, and it's sort of a higher order JSON. Um, really good, if you're into that sort of thing. <laughs> um, but you have any of those files, and, and trust me, you will have loads. You know, to, to, to find all the configurations of your, all your services and all, the, all your builds or whatever um, as they go through the pipeline, then you can write policies around the structure of them to make sure they conform. So, we're not done with Kubernetes yet, so we, we can still check Kubernetes um, manifests, because Kubernetes manifests are just YAML or JSON, depending on what you write. Most people use YAML. Um, so we can still analyze those, um, and but because we can do them standalone, we can do it much earlier. So if you've got a continuous deployment system, rather than triggering a deployment and having that deployment fail because the webhook says, sorry, you're trying to do something you shouldn't to my cluster, um, you, can not you can fail the deployment before it goes, gets that far to say what you would do isn't going to work. Um, so here's a couple of another more little bits of Rego. So in this case, um, we've got a policy that says uh, containers must not run as root. So in order to enforce that policy, we make sure we have a convention written down on a confluence page somewhere that says, when you create in a manifest for a deployment or a cron job or, or you know, anything else that eventually spawns a pod in Kubernetes, make sure you set the runners not root flag to true, please. Um, so yeah, that's great, not enforceable, hard to remember, Hope, you hope that that policy survives just purely through uh, cut and paste, right? Because people don't tend to write uh, deployment manifests by, from scratch every time. They just take one they've seen and they copy it and it works. But you know, the danger is someone's removed runners non root for their particular one and then that propagates through the system. So these, um, these are very simple policies. I'm not trying to teach you the Rego language here, right? You probably would, you'd probably be a bit more complicated in real life than say, uh, you know, unless a deployment is in my special list of whitelisted ones that are allowed to run as root, but, which I didn't bother putting in here. But that, that would be how you would um, write a couple of tests. Here's another one taken straight out of our best practice. Um, there's a bunch of the six labels that uh, Kubernetes recommends you put on every single object. And um, so, you know, we the system doesn't break if you don't, um, but it's really handy to have a consistent labeling scheme for your objects in Kubernetes. So we, we enforce them. We say, sorry, but I'm not accepting that deployment because, or that deployment definition, because you haven't included one of the six labels. And a more complex version of this would tell you which ones you've missed. And we run it, uh, we test that using 
the conf test tool. So uh, in this case, we're just taking two examples of a deployment manifest, a bad one and a good one, and we're showing rather obviously that the bad one fails because um, the deployment doesn't have what it needs and the good one passes. So as part of a um, build test, you know, that is a build test, right? You could include that in your system and uh, you know that that would fail a build if that was the case. I said earlier, Terraform and Kubernetes are my bread and butter. So Terraform as well. Terraform is a, is a beast and therefore writing policies for it is hard. Um, it's particularly as ConfTest at the moment doesn't support HCL2, which is what the latest Terraform uses. So, but we can get around that and, and we can do something. So, so here's an example. Um, all AWS assets must have cost code tags set. So not every asset in AWS supports tags, but those that do, uh, we want to, we've, got, we've decided that everything should have a tag called cost code. Um, and then our CFO, when he gets the uh, cost report at the end of the month or something, can, can sort of see what's, where, all the, where all the expenditure is attributed to. And code scrolled off the top, because it's a stupid presentation tool. Um, but it's all in there, um, and I'll just talk through some little bits of it that will pop up. So this, this um, sum thing is, uh, is great. So remember, this is a sort of a, this is a set of rules against a configuration file. Um, so that there's, you know, so there's no loops, there's no imperative code. It, it's designed to, um, you know, uh, to be provable as works. So in this case, what we're saying is there exists some value of i. Where a resource change that's in a Terraform um, plan, it, it, yeah, for that value of i, there is a resource change whose type is one of those resources that take tags. So that's a list of the AWS resources where we want to make sure the tags are. And after the Terraform change, that resource does not have a tag called cost code. So that's sort of, again, takes a little while to get your head around it, but that's kind of saying, we're gonna look at this um, Terraform. And, and the way we, we institute on, on Terraform, right, is that we, we do a Terraform plan, so that Terraform decides all the changes it wants to make, and then we take that plan, which is it's what it wants to do, and we turn that into a JSON representation, we shove that through ConfTest, and then ConfTest says, no. I'm not going to allow you to apply that because it violates our policies. Um, HashiCore do have a, in their enterprise tools, by the way, do have a built-in policy engine called Sentinel that goes across all of their tools. Um, works very, in a very similar way, you write the same sort of thing. So the same concept sort of exists if, you, if you're a paid-up member of the Atlassian, uh, sorry, of the HashiCore ecosystem. Uh, and another more common one we do with Terraform, especially if you're into a continuous deployment of infrastructure, which is like a really cool place everyone wants to get to, but most people are too scared to venture, uh, is about controlling blast radius. So, you know, the, you're quite happy to deploy tiny little changes, but, but really you'll be very wary of a change um, that affects too many objects in your, uh, say, in your AWS account. Um, and it's not a complete example, but, um, and some of it's missing off the bloody screen. Uh, but there's, a, there's an example on the, um, on the ConfTest website that shows how blast radius is sort of calculated and, and you can't see it because it's in this bit down here that's, that's missing. Um, but sort of, it basically it takes all of the uh, changes and it sort of says, okay, well, I'm gonna weight uh, deletions of instances at a 10 and uh, creations of autoscaling groups at a 10 and I'm gonna add up the blast radius of this change, and if it exceeds some, some total that I'm not happy will go through without a human intervention, then I'm, I'm not going to do it. Um, so it kind of stops uh, massive change from happening in one go. Again, it's a policy written down, right, that probably says uh, changes to more than 10 objects within, your, within the infrastructure need to be signed off by you know, someone or something like that. So this, this allows your continuous deployment system to uh, do all the little things, but stop when, 
when it's got something big that it needs doing. Um, right, so again, we've, we've moved back. We're using ConfTest now as part of our build system, but we're still mucking about with the uh, deployment side of things, and that's probably my bias, because that's, that's my area. But we can move further back, and we can look at, uh, you know, we can apply these policies to other things. Um, anybody use SNCC? Yeah, I like SNCC. Uh, there are many vulnerabilities. Other vulnerability scanners are available, uh, but SNCC's quite cool. Um, so you can imagine the, uh, our CISO, and our CISO is a piece of work. Uh, I love him dearly, but you know, he's, he's a proper CISO, and so he worries about these things. Um, and he hates the fact that we have high security vulnerabilities in our, uh, left in our code. Uh, so, yeah, his policy is probably there shall be no high vulnerability codes ever. Um, but the reality is, of course, that's really hard to implement. Um, you end up doing spending an awful lot of time on tech debt, and sometimes you just need to be able to wave them and say, okay, we know this one exists. We're going to wave it because we know that that will catch that when we do the refactor of that piece of code that's planned for next month. So in the time being, we're just going to, you know, we've assessed the risk, our risk appetite for that is okay. We're willing to accept that vulnerability. Um, so the way you do that in SNCC is you, is you create a waiver. Uh, and, you, and so this assumes that you've got SNCC looking at your, your code as part of your build process and saying, nah, sorry, I'm going to fail that build because you've got too many vulnerabilities. Um, and so what you need to do to get it through, to get it to pass, is either fix the vulnerabilities or waive them. So at the top is a what's called a policy file in, in SNCC land. Um, and basically it's just a list, it's, simplistically it's just a list, list of waivers. So it says, okay, here are, the, here are the vulnerabilities that I know exist in my code that I'm willing to, um, to ignore. And that allows you to then run SNCC on your code and have it pass even though it's got those vulnerabilities. And then down at the bottom here we've got our SNCC policy file policy, um, which says, okay, all right, I'm going to reluctantly agree that you can have waivers, but I'm going to be very, very strict about which wa waivers you're allowed. So in this case, I'm only allowing you to waive those two vulnerabilities. And um, I thought I had an example of it running. I don't. Um, imagine what happens when you run it. In this case, um, that second waiver there is not allowed, and so ConfTest will say, no, you've failed the test. I think I'll show, I'll show that later on. Another example that I, I threw in, you, you've probably got a lot of files that, that configure themselves with either YAML or, or whatever. Um, this is a, a Grafana instance that configures itself with a .ini file. Again, ConfTest supports .ini files. So there's a subsection of the .ini file for Grafana at the top. And then there's a policy down here that says, no, sorry, you, know, you, you must use HTTPS. It must be on this port. You must enable these functions. If you're going to deploy when Grafana, Grafana into our instance, those are our rules. And sure enough, when you run it, it fails. So those are examples of how you know, you can take anything. So, I mean, the configuration files that configure your, your services, you, maybe you want to make sure that um, debug is not left on in the, you know, the log configuration and those sorts of things. You can create policies for all of them. The smart ones in the room who are still awake may have spotted a flaw in, uh, in my evil plan to rule the world here in that um, I've got a build system that is going to run a set of tests and fail the build uh, and think. Uh, the, the engineer has access to that build system and therefore they can fiddle with the tests. So classic sort of engineering, but that rather than fix that test, I can hide it. Um, so they could do that with all of this stuff that, that I'm talking about uh, as well. Um, so, and you know, the other thing here is we're talking about a set of policy files that, you know, in, as, as you might assume uh, from what I've been saying, will live with the code. Um, so again, uh, an engineer can edit the policies. If he doesn't like the fact that a policy is, if he decides actually that policy is not for me because I'm special, 
um, he can edit it out of the set of policies and then all of a sudden his build will pass. So, you know, how do we get around things like this? So the conf test actually has um, thought about this um, and, and has a fairly neat solution. And the neat solution actually builds on two um, things in the, uh, in the ecosystem that exist. The first one, uh, RS, is so there's a trend, um, just an emerging trend, to say that actually um, yeah, we've got a fairly good standard for uh, container registries now, so uh, uh, OCI. Um, but why, why just use them for containers? It's actually quite a good standard for how to store data in, in a format that you, you know, it's versioned, it's immutable, you can fetch particular ver tags of it. It's kind of like a, you know, a really useful and a general purpose binary store. So why not use it for other things? And so there's this sort of movement, if you like, um, to sort of widen the scope of uh, OCI registries to use them as uh, cloud native artifact stores. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, there's a lot of really good ideas, very few implementations. So Azure is the only container registry, cloud container registry that you could go and sign up for and use today that supports this. But hopefully, some of the others will, will come soon because it is being adopted. Um, so that's a good place to store your policies. And the, the beauty of using that is you're not inventing another package manager. You're not saying, okay, well, we need a package manager for policies and it's separate from all our other package managers and it has to live over here and we've got to manage that and we've got to worry about that. Um, so this is like, no, we'll just chuck them in with the, into the OCI because it can store them. And then OPA itself, um, because it, um, in its sort of original context that it was designed for, you know, one of its compelling fact features is that it can, it can get live updates of policies. So you don't have to restart your service to get an update of the policy. All it, what it's going to do is it's going to check every now and then against a repository and pull down a new bundle uh, of policies. So you've already got that sort of capability to say, OK, we can bundle policies up into a package. Um, OPA does that for us. We can use a registry of storage to store that package. So we're not, we're not having to introduce any more tech we just uh, leverage those two things. And that's what ConfTest is doing. Um, yeah, so we're going back to my SNCC example. And here what I'm trying to show is that, um, to, to begin with, I, all I had was the uh, SNCC waivers file. I didn't have any policies. And then, so what I did is I pulled the latest SNCC policies from my uh, personal container registry. And that gave me, um, as you can see, a policy directory, and then I can run it. So that process of pulling them and running them um, you know, is what you'd put in your build system. And then by doing that, it means we've, re we've eliminated the, um, the sort of loophole where an engineer can go change the policies, because they can't. Only a security engineer or the, can go change the policies and push a new version of them. The, en the build engineer or the, or the developer is stuck with the, with the policies that we've decided he, he needs to follow. Um, so that kind of eliminates one uh, of those bad actor models. The other bad actor model, of course, is the developer just stubbing out the conf test call, but there's not much I can do about that. Uh, still thinking about that one. Now, this is great. We can write policies. It's all good. Um, but as soon as we, whenever we write code, we should really think about testing it. Um, and that's, that's another you know, thing that um, comes along with, with, the, with this sort of stuff. So you know, really, all, all code repositories should contain unit tests, and really, any code built by official CI CD press should be using production. So if, we, if, we, if, if those are the rules we're giving to the uh, developers, then we should follow them too. And if we're now managing a set of policies as an object in a registry that we update and push, and then that is essentially our production, and if we screw that up, then we could stop builds from working, which could, you know, the whole thing should, could come down in a house of cards, then we need to follow those um, same rules. And luckily, um, OPA does this for us. It supports testing, in, it's a very, it's a built-in test framework that is, um, you know, very similar to any test framework you would see. Again, this code, rather than starting at the top so that it could fit it all in, it's started halfway down and it's, the bit at the bottom is missing. Um, 
but there's one there you can see. So basically, um, this is code that goes along with, um, I gave you a very simple example earlier about uh, Kubernetes, making sure the uh, runner's non-root flag was set. So this is test code that goes along there. Um, so what this rule here is saying is, if I give it this input here, which is a, a Kubernetes deployment with no, um, without that flag set, it's a very simple one, obviously, uh, then it should deny that. And this test that you can't see, because it's somewhere off the screen, is the opposite of that. So if I give you a Kubernetes deployment that's got that flag set, then uh, you should get no violations. So we can use the, uh, the language here, and, and OPA has a built-in test uh, executor. Um, it works very, you know, works exactly the same as most unit test frameworks would, right? It, it looks in the, your policy directory. It recognizes that any, anything that starts test underscore something is a test, and it runs all of those, and it makes sure that all of those you know, with the context that you're given, pass, and, and you know, can output its format in, in standard sort of testy ways. So it, it becomes very easy to test your policies, which is kind of like freaky, right? Uh, I don't know how you test security policies written in a Word document. So, um, That's what I want to show you today. Uh, like I said at the beginning, or if I didn't, I meant to. This is this is a teaser, right? So, so this is an. In, I personally think this is a really powerful um, mechanism, and there's lots of interesting opportunities and in how um, we could use this to our benefit in the future. Um, so, some of policies really should be coded, not scribed. OPA is a really powerful and appropriate framework for doing that. And as a side note, if you do, you know, if you do think actually I want to implement policies, use, user specified policies into one of my services, OPA is a really good way to go. Um, Comptest is a, just a brilliant adaptation of that core into something that makes it really, really useful. And um, and they're beginning to really think about how that would work with the sort of registry support. Um, so although the ecosystem here is immature, and yeah, there's not many people jumping on this jumped on this bandwagon yet. I think personally it's worth the investment. It's something that I'm investing in personally because uh, I think it's, it's the right way to go. And with that, I will either sit down or answer random questions. So, uh, sorry. sorry, hand at the back. Uh, can systems similar to this be used for doing things like testing uh, doc strings or just general code documentation? I would imagine so. So th this can test anything that's structured. So, um, you know, if you've got a little bit of structure around your documentation, um, and, and quite a lot of the, um, you do have that more and more, don't you? I mean, I'm thinking off the top of my head, I'm thinking Open API, right? Open API is is one of those. I've forgotten the name of the what they call, but but, um, but one of those things where you, the the documentation and the and the code live live together and they're part of the same structure, you could definitely test that. Even if it's just as crude as to say, um, this needs to be documented, which is a little bit like IDEs often do, right? You know, they'll say, you can't write a public function without putting a comment in to say what it does and that sort of thing. You could write that uh, as long as there's structure. Yes? So uh, in complex teams, it's going to be quite hard to implement when you've got lots of different people. Have you got any examples of where it's been rolled out uh, in larger teams? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, um, I, and I say that flippantly, but I would imagine it probably hasn't, to be honest. This is sort of um, new, weird way of thinking about the world. Um, and yeah, so I, I don't know it's it's a hobby pro I know it's a hobby project for Gareth and the and the other contributors, but but presumably they're building up to something. I'm not aware of uh, any examples of it being used in anger. Um, we we I use it, but but very very light touch at the moment. Um, but I keep I, the thing that makes it compelling for me is I keep thinking of use cases, and I keep I keep coming back to it. And I and I and I. 
do struggle with the, the language, I'll say that. It, it, but again, it's because, you, know, I, I, you know, I was brought up as a C programmer who, 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 who sort of drifted into, into Go. I, I don't, you know, this is a very different way of writing code. Um, but, but I think once you get your head around that, I think it's, uh, it's definitely use case. Got limited time to work on this. Which part of the stack would you focus on implementing this in first? If I personally had some spare time, I would um, on this. I would definitely get it support, uh, ConfTest support for HCL two. So at the moment, Terraform is the thing that I would love to be able to check the most, and it's the hardest thing to check because of the format, and that's um, largely because. Uh, it, it, you have to sort of do the planning and things. So thinking about how you would integrate it into that, which, which I guess is, is working out what the open source equivalent of Sentinel, the commercial tool from, uh, from HashiCore is, what, what the play is there. Um, because yeah, a lot of the examples I think of are Terraform ones. And then that scares me off actually trying them because I know how complex it is to do that. The blast radius is a good example, but it's super complex when you dig into it. Uh, and it's, uh, it's subject to, you know, HashiCorp changing the, the way they structure their stuff on a whim. So, yeah. So you, you mentioned a few times that you've got a size of, what, what are his thoughts on this set of technologies? Is he, is he happy cutting the word documents into this kind of format? Any, any opinions? I am. Um, Uh, I think, yeah, I would imagine he would be. I, I don't think I've shown it to him, to be honest. Um, and that's not because I'm scared to. It's just because it, it hasn't, so that sort of interaction hasn't come up. Um, but, it, you know, he, he is continually frustrated by, um, you know, developers not following rules. And I continually tell him, yeah, it's like the vulnerabilities is a good example, right? He's continually frustrated by those, the, all those vulnerabilities in the code base. And I'm like, yeah, well, we're not, but we're not putting them front and center in front of the engineers. And, and if we did that, if we turned that on right now and said, right, from tomorrow, no high vulnerability stuff in our, um, in, in production at all, we would just, the whole thing would just grind to a halt and we've been six months of tech debt before we could deliver anything again, right? So you can't do that. But if we can slowly introduce, you know, if, if we can work out a way to sort of slowly get control of which ones we like and which ones we don't and, and lower that bar, um, I think he would be interested in that um, because he would, see, he would see a tangible effect as a CISO, right? Because he'd look at the vulnerability counts and he'd see it going down. I'm going to debrand myself because it's hot.